institutions in New York City. Specifically, he worked directly with people with mental illness and histories of incarceration to connect them to these services in the communities that will help them attain better measures of recovery and gain the stability necessary to avoid further contact with the criminal justice system. Drawing on the wisdom of 13 years of direct involvement with the criminal justice system, Mr. Perez also works to change unjust policies and practices in that system through the participation, through his participation as a newly appointed member of the New York Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, uh, Mr. Perez is also a member of the New York City Bar Association's Correction and Reentry Committee and a member of the Campaign for Alternatives to isolation, Isolated Confinement. Uh, Mr. Perez is a sought-after speaker and has spoken at Cornell Law School, Fordham University, which is in the Bronx, and Amnesty International, the United Nations, and various state, regional, and national conferences on various topics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Johnny is a member of the 2017 Just Leadership USA uh, Leading with Conviction program and is now in the process of completing his first nonfiction book, Uncuffed, Reflections on Criminal Justice After 13 Years of Incarceration. Uh, Ilham Askia is co-founder of Gideon's Promise and currently serves as the organization's executive director. Uh, Ms. Askia is responsible for creating the entire infrastructure of the organization from board development to daily operations. Her successful recruiting efforts allow the organization to attract top law school graduates and new public defenders to Gideon's Promise. In five years, she moved the organization from an annual revenue of $800,000 to $1.5 million. Under her stewardship, the organization runs five major programs that support more than 250 public defenders annually, therefore allowing thousands of clients to receive a Gideon's Promise uh, trained attorney. Askia continues to focus on educating communities about the criminal justice process and the efforts the organization is undertaking to reform it. So we're going to start out, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start out by having um, Illy, as we call her, and Johnny ask a, uh, answer a few questions um, to kind of give this all some context. And then we're going to invite you folks to the microphones and um, have you interact directly with them. And let's just check all the microphones on. Okay, so I think the first question um, we'll start out with, and Johnny, we'll start with you, is if you could share just a little bit um, about yourself, where, you're, where you were born and raised, and perhaps something that sticks out in your mind about your upbringing. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for hosting this conversation. I'm always honored to be in places where folks have opened up their, their spaces to, to have these conversations, which I would argue are very, very important conversations, you know? Um, you know, I was born in Cuba, came here in 1980, landed in New York by way of Connecticut. Um, actually, we were, we were changing buses in Port Authority, and someone stole all of our luggage, and by mm. default, we ended up staying in New York. Myself, my three brothers, and my mother slept in a small room, and the New Yorker, a, a police officer rented, us, re rented the room for us that night. And, um, you know, growing up as a teenager in New York City, you know, uh, coming from a quiet neighborhood, let's say Hartford, Connecticut, you know, it was really quite different, and I found myself uh, in trouble a lot. You know, throughout the, from the ages of 16 to 19, what sticks out most for me was actually my involvement with, you know, the criminal legal system. You know, and that looked different ways in different times. You know, I've been arrested for trespassing into my own building, you know. I've been arrested for loitering in front of my own home because I didn't have an ID, you know, uh, to show proof that I actually lived there. You know, um, uh, I've had interactions with police officers where they've confiscated money from me just because I didn't have a pay stub, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, for my mother trying to instill in me that, hey, you know, we, you should, you know, we come into this country, you should work hard, you know, um, you know, trust the systems that are in place, you know, to hold other people accountable, you know, always follow the law, always follow the rules. 
you know, uh, which for the most part I did, but there were times when that kind of, that, th that, uh, 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 that concept, you know, was really, I became disenchanted with the concept of justice, right? Because I was like, well, how is it that we are often victimized by the, at, the, at the hands of the same people that are supposed to protect us. But that wasn't my only experience. That was also the experience of many you know, men and women and kids, I should say, who also grew up in my, in my neighborhood of the Bronx. You know, ultimately, I, uh, at the age of 21, I probably criminal solution to poverty and, and I um, robbed a convenience store and ended up getting sentenced to 13 years in prison. Part of what fed that sentence was the fact that I was in and out the entire time from 16 to 19, you know, being arrested for a lot of misdemeanor charges, like I mentioned before, to the point that when I did get in front of the judge, I already had a 21-page rap sheet at the age of 21, mostly okay. for misdemeanors. Johnny, I'm yeah. going to ask you just to hold on because yeah, we're going to get to Illy, and we're yeah. going to follow up with that story in just a minute. But Illy, if you can ask, answer the same question, you know, where, did, where were you born and raised? And... Um, what is something that maybe sticks out about your upbringing? Well, Anthony, first, thank you for inviting me and the Barton Foundation for having me. And as you were reading my very, um, I call it encyclopedia-like bio, which now I know we have to change, um, I actually grew up on the other side of the state. I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York. And um, the reason I started Gideon's Promise, which trains, recruits, and mentors public defenders, were. 80% of the people who are charged in the criminal justice system qualify for a public defender. So as a criminal defense lawyer that is appointed by the county or the state to represent someone who's accused. So I work with lawyers all across the country to provide excellent representation for people who can't afford attorneys. Um, the reason I started an organization, um, if you look on my website, I actually am an educator. I went and got my degrees in education because I wanted to stop the school to prison pipeline um, and ended up in public defense after reflecting on my life. When my dad, uh, when I was five years old, my father was sentenced to prison and spent 10 years in Attica Correctional Facility. Um, at that time, I had two younger siblings and my mother was pregnant. And with his incarceration, and because we did not have a lot of money, he was appointed a public defender who never spoke to my mother, never asked her about the impact it would have on our family if the breadwinner was taken away. And so unfortunately, he was sentenced to Attica, which is in my, still, to me, one of the worst state institutions in the country. So although he was not at Rikers, which is a jail, he went to prison um, and did time. So as I'm watching this, I'm reflecting on my visits to mm. the prison. So I left education because I started to watch the trajectory of the students that taught in DC public schools. And I knew if they didn't have a caring teacher along the way, and they made a mistake, or they happened to be standing outside their house without the proper ID, the system would, have, would absorb them. And the last person on the line to actually defend them before the state took their liberty away would be a public defender. And so that's how I ended up um, in this role for the last 11 years. Thank you. So Johnny, why don't you continue with your story? Share with us how you um, began and got involved with your, your uh, participation and our experience with the criminal justice system. Yeah, so, so while I was incarcerated, I discovered the transformative power of education, right? I, you know, I, I, I tell people I really didn't, I mean, I've never stepped inside of a college classroom, and when I did, it was inside of the penitentiary. You know, and it completely blew my mind. You know, it's funny how education works. You know, it, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know, mm -hmm. and that in turn fuels your need to want to know more. Mm -hmm. You know, and then being incarcerated and having a, a, an incredible amount of free time on my, hand, on my hands, I found myself uh, doing a lot of reading, so, you know, taught myself a lot, you know, spent some, a lot of days, months, if not years, inside a law library, you know, and trying to really learn, get a deeper understanding of the system that has not only claimed my life, but also had impacted my daughter. Because what I did mention before was that I was arrested two days you know, after my daughter was born. So when I was released, she was the same age as the amount of time that I did in prison. And, and upon my release, I realized you know, that I actually had something that a lot of people in society you know, didn't have, and that was direct experience of how exactly this system works. The same system that sometimes we believe works, or even, I mean, we even call it the criminal justice system. <laughs> I stopped doing it. I call it the criminal legal system, criminal punishment system, 
um, not only because of what I've seen with my own eyes, but also the clients that I've served in my last role and now in, in this current role where I'm working more on policies. You know, um, and uh, from that experience, you know, I realized that people that are really close to the that are really close to the problem also have ideas about what the solution should look like. Uh, but more importantly, to be able to share that information with those of you who have never seen the inside, but still, you know, have been impacted by the system in a number of different ways. Because let's face it, right, with 2.3 million people in incarcerated, another 70 million people who have a criminal record on file, chances are, if not you, someone who you know, or your next door neighbor has been touched by the tentacles of the system in some way, shape, or form. And Illy, can you tell us how you made the transition from education to uh, you know, the work I, you do now? I've, I've told this story before. So my husband uh, was a public defender. And the interesting thing about it is when I first met him, oh my god, 20 years ago, um, he gave me his business card. He worked for the DC Public Defender Service, which is the top defense um, public defender in the country. And I despised public defenders. After what happened to my father, I said, you were part of the system. I don't like you. You know, I, I call it the criminal injustice system. Mm. Um, and so I don't want anything to do with you. And so um, he took me. Uh, they used to have these going away parties when public defenders would leave. And sometimes they would go to private firms or they'd go into law schools. And I started to meet all these really passionate defense attorneys. And, I was like, this, I've never seen anybody care about their clients. They would invite their clients to barbecues. They would really talk to their clients. And that didn't happen as I was growing up. So fast forward years later, um, he asked me to uh, take a year off to start Gideon's Promise. And so um, I said, no, I went paid all this money for all this good education. And my mom <laughs> made all this sacrifice for me to go to this Ivy League fancy school. Um, but something needed to be done. And like I stated before, when I saw my high school students started to get arrested, and when I saw a little girl in my high school, who she was 14, she got in trouble and expelled because she, was, she carried a blade to school. And the reason she was carrying the blade is she forgot to put it under the rock in the tree before she went into the school because she needed the blade to protect herself to go back into her neighborhood that night. Mm. And my thing was, what would happen to her if someone pulled her over, she would go to prison and she would go into the jail. And so I, I had to do something. I just had, and I actually, Anthony, I really just forgot your question because I start telling this story, but <laughs> I had to, I, I, I couldn't continue to watch the education system fail its children. We are using the criminal justice system to fix our societal ills. And as we know, it's not happening. Mental health, poverty, the lack of education. I watch and walk into schools here in Atlanta that have metal detectors for our children. How are we socializing children? My children go to Inman, most of you here from Atlanta, Inman Middle School is right in a very affluent, nice, cheerio neighborhood. They even have metal detectors. How are we socializing our children? And what are we telling them? What is the message? And so I've just felt like somebody has to tell the story of why these gentlemen you saw, you know, Johnny himself, why they should not be locked into cages. They are human beings. And we have lost sight of that. And so the organization is, what is the root cause of the narrative? We want to fix it. We want to say, oh, we'll do less sentences. That's not fixing it. What is causing us to lock away our own people? Hmm. There is something morally wrong in our core that you are accepting a narrative that is presented to you. And so public defenders, the public defenders we work with are charged with changing that narrative. And so I had to get out of education and figure out how to help some people who want to do good work who are starting to become the problem. And that's what's happening. A lot of people don't like defend public defenders because they are processing people, because they're forced into a dysfunctional criminal justice system that does that. So our role is to figure out how do we slow it down. Thank you. And Johnny, so how did you manage to use your experiences at Rikers to embark upon this career once you were out? What, what about you or what about Well, well the, the main thing was the reentry. You know, I came, I came back into society, right, and I realized that I had not crossed the street for the last 13 years. You know, um, I hadn't even gone to a Starbucks. I remember going to Starbucks for the first time and the woman, the barista, was like, Johnny, what are you, what are you, not Johnny, but sir, what are you going to have? 
And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to have. She's like, you've never been to Starbucks? I'm like, no. She's like, what, you've been stuck in a cave? I'm like, yeah. Mm. You know? <laughs> and, you know, but I went on over 50, 60 job interviews before I was finally hired by the Mental Health Project, which I don't work for no more. You know, but I also had to navigate all of these other intricacies of society, right? I had to also figure out housing. I had to figure out, you know, um, just regular things like that. You know, they won't even touch screen phones when I, when I went away. You know, and then I, even college educated while I was incarcerated, I found myself very, you know, um, frustrated by trying to navigate all of these different systems, but then more importantly, also trying to learn to come back to a family that has learned to live without me for so many years. And what does that look like, you know? Um, and then, you know, I navigated that fairly well. And then I also noticed a lot of my friends or people coming back from society were actually were not as lucky. In fact, most of the folks, right? You know, in New York, you get released. You know, you get $40, a bus ticket, and a pat on the back and say, thank you for coming. You know, and then we expect people to come back and just, you know, assimilate into society. I think Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, <laughs> then you'll be disappointed every single time. And that is the best way for me to describe reentry. So using my direct experience with these systems and how to navigate these systems, I've managed to get a job helping people reenter society. Because like, who better to help you come back than somebody who had to come back themselves? And from that experience, I, I realized that I also had experience in other areas, whether it was you know, education, you know, alternative to incarceration, you know, and also just the, the, an insight as to who's actually inside of our prisons and who's inside of our jails. You know, so now today, I rely on the, on the wisdom of those experiences to do exactly what I hope to do today, is just really raise the public consciousness around these issues. Thank you. And Ili, <clears throat> yours will be the last question before we invite the audience to, to ask you folks some, some questions and share their thoughts. Um, what do you see as a way in which folks can get involved? I know you're doing work and your colleagues at Gideon's Province, but what can the average person maybe sitting here today do to contribute to eroding what I you call the criminal injustice the, system? The first thing is popular culture media is everything. Everything, I don't even watch the news. I get all my news guiltily through Facebook. And I, something scrolls up, and then I'm hitting whatever CNN is blasting, and I'm getting that. It's, everything is very quick. And so what I always tell the public, really the first thing to do, is ask the questions. What is missing in the narrative that you are seeing right now? What is the story that is happening? What is absent from that story? So I will say this, one of the big things is make yourself aware and get in proximity. Brian Stevenson, who is, I, I know many of you have heard from Equal Justice Initiative. I, I love Brian, mm -hmm. love him. Mm -hmm. um, and I stalk him sometimes when we are both speaking at the same events. But <laughs> um, one of the things is get in proximity and ask the questions, right? Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Law and Order is the longest running TV show in history. It is so long running. They have Law and Order this, SVU, Miami, whatever, right? There's like 27 versions. But it starts off with saying there are two players in the criminal justice system. The police that are, arrest folks and the prosecutors who are admitted with the charge. Nowhere in that narrative of a show that has run over 20 years do they even once mention, mention the criminal defense attorney. Mm. Go back and watch it. it it's probably, right, reruns are probably on tonight. No one talks about the public defenders. We talk about criminal justice reform. It is the new hot topic over the last three, four years. Um, and I've watched, I do believe we need police reform. I do believe we need, definitely need reform in the prosecutor's office and stop overcharging people. We definitely need programs and reentry like New Way of Life in California and all these other organizations that are doing great work. But no one's really talking about how do we prevent people from even getting sent to Rikers? How do we get to tell Johnny's story about all the things on that 21-page document that led to his arrest and his charge? What is the narrative? I mean, simply having a lawyer standing next to you and advocating for you when no one else, everyone has thrown you away simply because you are charged. I think the real critical thing about this film is People were sitting, some of them pre waiting for their sentence, but many of them were pre-trial. Pre-trial. They haven't even, they, and they were there because they were too poor to pay. And here in Atlanta, thank goodness, Mayor Bottoms just recently signed legislation in February with a number of good 
organizations came together, including mine, to stop charging people and, and setting bonds that they cannot make simply because they were too poor to pay. Pay attention to what's happening and why is it so easy for us to do it? Why is it so easy? Hmm. And who can tell the story? And I think that is the biggest, the most frustrating part about the work I do is the public defenders, and I know I'm a cheerleader for public defenders, and I'm not saying everyone had a good one. My father did not, which is why I'm doing the work to make sure people like me get good attorneys. But why aren't we talking about how they can help reform the system? They are not the ones sitting at the table, like Johnny said, just like they're not people, family members of formerly incarcerated people. People who are formerly incarcerated aren't sitting at the table when these policies are made. They're made and then we are told, go and carry them forward. But that's not how we would have written them. So I would, I would encourage people to really start just getting on this fast track. The information is there. You just have to go and ask the question. I want to add on to that sure. too. You know, like sometimes we forget that politicians work for us. Mm. Right? And I can't tell you how many states I've been where people don't realize that they, the power that they have to engage their legislators and also hold them accountable. You know, um, you know, in this country, you organize either money or people. If you don't have money, you organize people. And we are largely responsible, you know, to you know, hold our, our legislators accountable. In other words, there's someone in an office right now saying that you want a policy that you probably never even heard of or even want. But because, you know, silence can sometimes be, you know, um, uh, 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 I want to say complacency in a sense. You know, but mm -hmm. going back to what you said about language and narrative, you know, the one thing that you can actually start doing right now the minute you leave this door, this room, is to, to reframe the language that you use when describing people who've been impacted by the system. This is important. The reason this is important is because a lot of these policies are passed because these folks are not seen as human in the first place. With the language that we use to describe people that's been impacted by the system, right? Ex-con, convict, jailbird, inmate. Felon. Felon, right? Mm -hmm all reduces that person to that one chapter in their life when people are more than that. And the other piece is that we also give ourselves permission to treat people a certain way when we use certain language. Mm. We saw it in World War II, and I won't repeat any of that language, but we see it now. Because there's things that we can do to a convict that I can't do to somebody's daughter. Mm. Although one, those may be one and the same. And we know that language, to a large degree, shapes perception, and perception, to a large degree, also shifts how we react and how we behave towards people. You know, so if, if, unless we see people as people, then we won't start treating people as people. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna open it up if someone has a question. There are mics on either side of the room. Please step up and ask a question. Yes, I have a question and maybe a little. I, I get everything and it's mind boggling obviously, but I heard you talk about getting your uh, degree there and I saw the gentleman in the piece talk about getting his master's there. Uh, can you tell me uh, what kind of situation one goes through to even try to get a degree in jail, the, the repercussions, because I saw repercussions for everything else. Can you tell me about that, please? That's a real good question. One, you should know that I actually didn't get a degree in jail. I got it in prison. You know, for, you know, for folks who, who may not know, you know, jail is where you go to when you're just being accused of a crime. You're technically still legally innocent in the eyes of the law, and prison is after you've been sentenced. So I was able to go to, um, to college while I was in prison. And that was really luck of the draw. You know, in New York, not all, not all prisons are uh, um, where people have opportunities to go, to, go to, to college. And even those who do end up in college, you know, a lot of the correction officers, you know, um, feel that people in prison shouldn't be educated. You know, I have CEOs tell me, hey, you know, why should you get a free college education while I'm paying, I don't know, X amount of dollars for my daughter to go? And the minute that you look the wrong way, I'm gonna take this away from you. You know, um, and that can, look, that can look different ways also. You know, in, in prison, you know, you can go to solitary for almost anything. You can be removed out of a program for almost anything, whether it's having contraband, like cash and cigarettes, you know, um, or just refusing a direct order, which seems to be like the blanket statement while a lot of folks are finding themselves either in solitary or being removed from certain programs. You know, and then, and then of course, you also have these situations where just, you know, um, any little thing that you do across the road to just remove you from there. Again, because th this is ideology that criminals are, are born and not made. Mm. So it's like, you know, like I, I had one DOC person at a public hearing in New York said, you know, um, you know, uh, if, if, we, if we teach a burglar computer skills, then what you have is a computer hacker. These folks can't change. 
You know what, I would argue that if you do that, when the, what you have now is a software engineer and a person who can provide for their family and not feel like they have to apply a criminal solution to whatever problems they're facing. You know, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's unfortunate because right now we're in a state in our country where there's a pilot program to reintroduce um, Pell and Tap to people that are currently incarcerated, but that's not uh, the same throughout every state. I think there's only about 65 different jurisdictions have been chosen for that. I am not a policy person, but I have in the last probably two years started to pay more attention to my local politics. We get, um, the federal, there's a lot happening in the federal government. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. And the, the, we're, being re we're really focused on what's happening federally. And a lot of folks are so drawn to this, I call it the squirrel, squirrel, <laughs> and not paying attention to what's happening in the local politics. The reason why we had bail reform here in Atlanta was because people started to pay attention. We have judges that sit on the bench here that are fighting against the recent bail reform. They want poor, a homeless man, Sean Ramsey. Uh, AJC did a story in September about, about Sean Ramsey. Homeless man holding a sign up saying, homeless, please help. And he was arrested for trespassing, fined $200, which we know he couldn't make, sent to the city jail, and then transferred to the state jail, and then they couldn't find him. And if it wasn't for, right, Pastor Warner, when, if it wasn't for the Southern Center for Human Rights finding this man, he would have been in a, just sitting there. He was homeless. And people thought, administrators of the courts thought that that was fair and just. And so what I say is really pay attention to your local politics because that's where the decisions are being made right now. We know there's craziness going on the federal level. We know that. But it's really the, the city level that's impacting our own community. Thank you. Ma'am? Mm -hmm. Hi. Are, are there organizations working with foster care reform or looking at the foster care's um, uh, role in people getting incarcerated? Um, we do not. We solely work with public defenders. But what we have tried to do, Gideon's Promise, really has tried to work with other organizations um, social service organizations. So one of the things we do is we have kids who are in foster care, teenagers, who um, have internships in our program. So that's our way to give back, but we're not, we don't really focus on in that area for, in policy for foster care. Yeah, so I'm, I sit on the board of the Juvenile Law Center out of Philadelphia, and they basically, um, they're really focused around litigation, but one of the issues that they've just taken on, um, I said, no, they've been looking at it for a while, but really had doubled down on, is the, uh, the foster care to prison pipeline. How kids are in foster care are more likely to become criminalized, become impact, you know, come in touch with the system and trying to prevent ways in which they can, you know, actually be touched by the system. Because we know in foster care, you, uh, a lot, you age out. So what was happening with a lot of these folks is that they were just like left homeless and then as a result end up breaking the law in a lot of different ways and then end up in the system. So rethinking about what does life after aftercare look like for these young people uh, so they don't become just as involved. There's an organist I love promoting, there was Georgia Appleseed, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. They do a lot with juvenile, juvenile detention and policy. So a few years ago, they fought really hard to eliminate, um, uh, parents were allowed to waive the rights of their children in terms of getting attorneys. So for some parents, it was just like, you know, I've been having trouble with this kid, they need to learn a lesson. Maybe if this happens, mm. they won't do this not realizing you were waiving the rights of your child and then that child, because once you are in the system, you just keep going. So that's the only organization off the top of my head that I think is doing really good work and probably is working with the, the, the foster care system and figuring out how to uh, tackle some of the challenges. Thank you. Sir? Um, I was curious, I work in the education system and I noticed, of course, that um, you had shared earlier about your previous work as an educator. Um, I know there was a situation that happened in Florida recently where a, a teacher was ousted for having a white supremacist um, podcast mm -hmm. and saying it was satire, but many students said, how many students that were black did she tutor and how many students were mistreated? And one thing I've seen in education, um, for my the students that end up from that school to prison pipeline, there's a lot of mistreatment toward them and targeting. You know, people don't realize when they got expelled, why they were expelled, they were just told there, were, there was a behavioral disparity. And so as an educator, I was wondering, uh, is there any work being done 
regarding this kind of education in the school system so teachers know when profiling is happening and that others can recognize when a student may be unfairly sent into the system? There's a term called implicit, implicit bias, right? Mm -hmm. And we use a lot racial implicit bias in, this, in the criminal justice system. I left education because of that frustration um, where I saw children being labeled and not really right. Once again, what is the root cause of Tim coming to school and throwing his desk down and standing on top of it? This is a true story and saying, now what, what you going to do? And he's only in the first grade, right. right? I think the challenge is that we're not giving enough resources to our teachers to help us figure out, and I still claim myself as a teacher, to figure out how do we help a kid like Tim. I have seen um, recently, oh, I cannot think of the program right now, but they've been, it's, it's um, working with, I call it more holistic support instead of sending kids for suspension. Mm -hmm. They've been doing things, alternative detention, where really trying to figure out meditation and how to calming, but it's not in every school in Atlanta. I know APS is starting to do that. Um, and if I can think of it well, before we go, I'll make sure I tell you about it. Social emotional learning, thank you. Uh -huh. um, thank you so much. Um, and that, I have a friend who's been training teachers on, on, on working with students in that, and I'm interested to see what the numbers say um, once it's kind of gone through a, a number of a Atlanta public schools. Right. Thank you, yes. So you mentioned public policy, um, and I've worked in government in the past, and public policy matters. So there are people who get tickets who find themselves in prison. There are people who, for all sorts of misdemeanors, find themselves in prison simply because, like the film stated, they could not pay the, uh, a small bill because they, for whatever reason, just don't have the funds. Is there any sort of policy nationally that would limit how much money local municipalities could make from just locking people up for traffic tickets? Case in point, uh, some cities were basically, some cities and counties were basically making their whole budgets from over-ticketing people. So is there sort of any movement with limiting how many people we're going to put on probation? Is there any sort of limit on how many people we're going to just ticket just for the sake of ticketing so we can have a robust budget? <laughs> so, you know, federal stays very separate from state and county. And unfortunately, states, and, states get funding, and then a lot of times the states say, okay, counties, you handle, you'll get X number of dollars. And then if the county does not have enough in its budget, it has to come up with, I call, creative ways to fund its systems, right? So if you look at the counties in Georgia, Fulton County and DeKalb County are very well-resourced counties. They get state funding, but a lot of the money, and I'll talk about the Public Defender Office, a lot of the funding comes from the tax dollars, right, from their county. But if you're in an affluent county, you'll, you tend to have better resources. And I won't say the best, right? But it, it's on a state to state, county by county. If you go into some of our rural counties in Georgia, they have very small budget items. And so for public defense, that, you know, compared mm. to the DAs, it's always going to be small. And so in terms of federal legislation, there's none that really mandate, there are things that they cannot do. Like you have to have a lawyer if you cannot afford, that is a federal mandate. But what that lawyer looks like, the quality of that lawyer and how much money goes towards them, it depends. Um, so that's why I say it's really important to look at what's going on in the state and, and the local level. Yeah, I, w I would only add, and like you, uh, not much to add to that. Like you know, there's uh, uh, just recently uh, the Trump administration convened a, uh, I want to say a group of people, you know, um, at the White House to talk about criminal justice reform and exactly what that looks like. Um, I was kind of mad as I wasn't invited. I feel like I should have been there, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but part of that package is 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 the sentencing reform, and there is. People are divided along the lines of, of exactly what does that look like as far as this, how much sentencing reform, who's being sentenced for how long, and things of that nature. But even, even at the best case scenario, like you said, like, there is this, this difference between, there, it won't impact folks on like, the most local, local level. Um, we're going to have these last three questions be the final questions and then um, ask Reverend Warnock to come up. Um, 
Well, first of all, I'd certainly like to thank all three of you standing on that stage. Anthony, your work with the uh, foundation, who I've met some weeks ago. Thank you. And you two young people. I also, I grew up in Harlem. I didn't know where Rackers Island was. And you saying Buffalo, being a Harlem night, nothing mattered except Harlem. So the island and Buffalo, that was a foreign place. I say that to say that um, I think we as a people, we're most gracious, we're spiritual, we're so kind. But we must not forget this whole situation that's going on right now is the same thing that's gone on since the very beginning, as it, being enslaved. I look a lot at uh, Dr. Francis Krauss Wilson, who talks about racism, white supremacy, and all the ills that we encounter even to today. Even with your Willie Lynch letter, supports everything that's going on at this very moment, this eternal now. Until we understand who we are, who we are as a people, and begin to become a critical mass and get our own agenda, agendas, thank you and thank you. It's the same thing. It's about the survival of the minority in the world. This whole thing is about their survival. And as long as we're incarcerated, we're imprisoned, we're killing one another, our children, and all the other thing, eugenics and, and, and vaccines, the less of uh, us, the more content they are in terms of survival. That's the bottom line. We must not forget that. That's what's true. That's what's true. And I understand that so, so preciously in my 70s now. And like you say, local level, you're absolutely right. We've just become the city of Stonecrest. Ms. Vivian, I'm sorry, but did you have a question? Because we okay. have two folks we want to okay, wrap up. Okay, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to say that in the question is, um, I, I could form a question out of that. Uh, the young man and young lady, uh, I just question your, your worth and what you're doing. That would be my question. To could question your worth and what you're doing and just to continue on. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. No? Hello, I am truly, briefly seeking edification because, help me understand, does the, um, the attorney, that the public defender, aren't they paid by the court? So this is the same court that has imprisoned my brother and sister. Why should I trust the wolf to be guarding the hen house. I'm, I'm truly seeking edification. I don't understand. So, so that's a question I get all of the time. So the challenge we had when we started Gideon's Promise working with public defenders is th that question. Aren't public defenders all part of the same team? Because I see them talking to the DAs. They get a check just like the DAs and the solicitors. But the public defender, is rep they are to represent the person who is accused. They are not, I, we have seen, I'm, I'm not, we have seen poor public defenders. I, there are some bad ones out there. But they are also in a system where they cannot turn away their clients. So if someone is charged, I have lawyers who have on average 300 clients a year mm. with multiple charges. And so what happens is they get caught in a system of processing people, taking pleas, right? So there's stats out there where 95% of people are pleading to things they did not do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to help you understand, the prosecutor's role is once someone is arrested and then they decide if they're gonna charge them. What's happening in the system, which is wh why we have such a huge backlog of cases, is because they are overcharging. So you get charged with trespassing, it's gonna be trespassing, it's gonna be talking back to a police officer, it's gonna be a number of charges they can get. Now you are the client, and I am your public defender, and I say, Ms. Askia, right now they have six charges against you. If you plead guilty to this one up here, you can go home today. Mm. And what is happening with our public defend, the public defense system, is not that public defenders want to go in and make their clients take pleas, but sometimes the alternative is 
take this plea, you go home. You don't lose your job, yeah. you don't lose your kids, right? You get to go back home. Then the alternative is go to trial, which is very costly and the state doesn't want you to do that. And so what happens is you see this system mm -hmm. of public defenders to go in, but that's not what public defenders were set up to do. They are supposed to defend the accused. And so what we are doing is trying to train our lawyers to slow down the system, put a roadblock, advocate for your client at bail, tell their story of why it is important they go home. So it's not, they're not, they're not, they're supposed to be adversaries. It's an adversarial system. And so what we're trying to do is get that back, but in being an adversarial system, remember the first duty as a public defender is to your client. And what you probably have seen across the country is that's not happening. But there's so many variables that are preventing the lawyers that I work with from doing their jobs effectively. Because when they do, our clients get lesser sentences, our clients go home, but then 200 other clients are falling through the wayside as we try to protect the, the 10 that are in front of us. So um, I I'm hope I'm answering your question, but really public Thank defenders you. are meant for the people who are being, who are accused. I also want to add on to that, right? So, you know, uh, take a charge like trespassing, right? You sent to a place like Rikers Island where, you know, the minute that you walk in, you have to decide whether you're going to be prey or predator, right? The food is cold, first meal is at four o'clock in the morning, they wake you up, they handcuff you, they shackle you at the waist, shackle you at the waist, shackle you at the arms, shackle you at the feet, and then you go through this long, arduous process before you even see the judge, right? You're shackled to another person, you get on the bus, it takes like three, four hours. You know, if you've never sat handcuffed at the waist for three or four hours, it will completely mm. um, diminish any type, I mean, it's, it's like psychological warfare. Mm. Then you get inside the bullpen, you know, if you're lucky enough, you'll get there in time for lunch, and lunch looks like a cold bologna sandwich and a quarter water, little small, Kool-Aid juices. And then finally, after maybe six or seven hours later, from the minute that you woke up at three, four o'clock in the morning, you finally see your, your public defender. Mm -hmm. And he has a case like this, you know, like all of these different files, and it's like, probably doesn't even know what I was arrested for. I had, I had one attorney ask me, what was I arrested for? I'm like, you were supposed to tell me what I was arrested for. You know, and at that point, you're just so psychologically drained Right? And, and not to mention that I was, there was plenty of times I was arrested while I was going somewhere where people didn't even know that I was locked up. And it's like, okay, so, Johnny, what do you want to do? Well, what do you mean what I want to do? I want to go home. Well, if you, you can go home today if you cop out, if you plead. Or you can go to trial, and that's a little bit longer process, you know, and we don't know what that looks like, but we can mount a good defense. So because you want to go home to, you know, I want to go home back to my family, I want to go home to my job, I want to go home back to my life, of course, 99% 99, 99 of the time, I would say, I would do whatever I need to do to just leave here home. today. Whatever you need to do, make it happen. To the point earlier about doing that for so many years, that by the time you get you know, um, in front of a judge, you ha I had this like long, I still have long rap sheet to it. Well, you've, had, you know, you've been convicted of this, convicted of this, convicted of that. And then even my teenage, um, ignorance, I thought, oh, it's just nothing. It's just a small misdemeanor and I'll go home. But that, those are actual convictions. Mm. Right. You know, and, that right. change the sentencing guidelines mm. later on, you know, that can turn a, something you could get five years to, for to maybe 10 or twice as that. Right. And if you don't have a trained public defender that really educates their client on, if you say guilty to this plea mm -hmm. and these other charges have happened, these are the consequences. And so that's the, the reason I work my public defenders so hard is so that our clients do not have to face those other things that happened before because the collateral consequences are devastating, right? A conviction is devastating. My brother is, he just was released last year. He went back for, he was back a second time because of a probation violation, right? And not realizing when he pled out seven years ago, eight years ago, the judge is like, oh, Mr. Askia, you're back. Mm -hmm. Well, that simple whatever is now most people will get six months, you don't get four, four years. Mm -hmm. You're gonna finish your federal time that you didn't finish, mm -hmm. and we're gonna add the state. So his lawyer, his public defender, needed to make sure he told him that even if he decided to take a plea. We want our lawyers to zealously advocate for the clients, even if they have a stack. And what we do is try to guide them to how to do that, how to be creative. They don't have the resources, 
right? Prosecutors get all the investigators. They got five investigators. They have DNA experts, things like that. In Clayton County a few years ago, I think it was about eight, nine years ago, they had just got a really big working copier. One of our public defenders said, we just got a brand new copy. I said, well, what were you doing when you were printing your motion? She said, I was going to FedEx. Mm. Wow. Right? True stuff. George, I love telling Georgia stories, right? <laughs> I do. I have others, South Carolina, North Carolina. But it, it's, it's the disparity. It's, not, it's this disparity in the system that is set up. And I agree with you. It is about race. Ooh. It is about race, and it is about money. And when you can create a narrative about pe other people, pe marginalized communities, it is so easy to lock them away. And that is true. Look at the, the other thing people can do is look at the number of prisons in Georgia. Look at the state prisons, the private prisons in the state of New York. Look at how people are capitalizing. Big industries, if you have not watched Ava DuVernay's uh, documentary 13, please go do it tonight. It is so telling about we just found a new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. We found a new way to do these. We created a narrative about poor white kids in West Virginia, right? We created, we've been saying a narrative about poor black kids and Latino kids. We just found a new way to say it. Red line is illegal. We just found another way not to let people get housing, right? We call it something else, right? And so it is the truth. I mean, you have to educate yourself um, and I will give you all the tools you need to learn about the criminal justice system, but it's unfair. And that's what's happening with public defenders is they're not getting the resources they need to advocate for the clients that are accused. Thank you. And our last question. I know that we're pushed for time. Do you want me to ask afterwards? No, no. Are we, we that pushed for time? Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a, one more public defender question, kind of a follow-up to what was just asked. In my mind, I picture public defenders being overworked and underpaid for the job they have to do. You talked about having 300 cases or something like this for, for a year. What, first of all, is that perception correct that they are so swamped that it's a matter, it's not just a matter of trying to get them to take pleas for the sake of the client, it's they have so many people to represent, much like social worker and educators, that, that kind of, and if that perception is correct, what could we do to help public defenders I know that you talked about slowing down the system. What could we do on a local level to help public defenders have a, a fair shot at representing the people entrusted to them? Yeah, so it's absolutely correct. I, I mean, my, I think my highest office in New Orleans, New Orleans lawyers, I think last year a guy closed 300 cases. In some cities, depending on where they are, it's 150. The American Bar Association says a public defender should hold no more than 150 cases. In my opinion, that's, would you hire a lawyer that had 150 cases? I wouldn't. Um, and that's the American Bar Association mm. said that. And so, yes, that's the average caseload is 150. The lawyers I work with who are heavily concentrated in the South, most of our work is in North Carolina, South Carolina, because the greatest concentration of incarcerated people and the number of lack of quality public defenders are here in the South. Hmm, what is that true? What, I wonder why. Um, but yes, that, that, that number is, is true. How you can help, really, it comes back to advocating locally, right? Um, it's making sure that the public defender offices, they have parity with the prosecutor's office. Right now, usually on average, our PDs, our, the, the pre PD office gets a third of what the prosecutor office is getting, right? Solicitor, prosecutor, depending on where you are. They need the resources. They need the training. Um, I will, that's another huge problem. Sometimes our lawyers go into court, they come into the office, they shadow attorney for three days, they're given that stack of cases and they say, go represent people. Our offices do not, even DeKalb, one of the most wealthy counties in the country, they do not have enough money in their training budget. And I always say this, would you have a doctor operate on you who really only had Two, 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 two months of experience and never did open heart surgery, but now you want to do that to me. You're asking lawyers, young lawyers, to entrust someone, your loved one's life without the proper training, mentorship, and support. So one, one way is to, number one, go to the PD offices and talk to the chief defenders to see what do you need. Number two is, what do you need? They'll be very candid with you, right? They need investigators. 
They need community organizations that can help their clients. So when clients get arrested and you try, you advocate for their release, either an ROI, which is a return on your own recognizance, or a bond, you actually make bond. And the only thing is they need to go to a program. I need to go to a um, anger management program or a, 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 a child advocacy program. There are not a lot of those social services out there or the offices don't have the resources to go find them. And so what we're really trying to do is build relationships with community organizations to help that because we don't want to wait to the re-entry phase. We don't want them to go to prison in the first place. And so that's the big, a lot of organizations now is finding organizations in the city who are doing work to help people before they get put in the system. And I probably have a dozen more, but you can email me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Johnny, do you have a final thought before we ask Pastor Warnock to come up? Yeah, um, to, 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 to your point earlier, right, about, you know, what we're talking about here is fruit from a poisonous tree, and that tree being mass incarceration, and that tree being, you know, uh, a system that was built on ideologies of racism, oppression, discrimination, marginalization, every other Asian that you can probably think of, you know. Um, once we grasp that, then we can approach it differently. So. You know, with that being said, I, I always ask folks, you know, to, it seems like there's a big task, right? This is a huge elephant, right? But you don't have to take down the whole elephant, right? If you grab the tail, if you grab the leg, right? If you grab the tusk, right? And just pull according to your capacity, according to how big your hands are, your resources, your networks, with the hope that other people are also on the other side of this giant elephant doing the same thing, eventually we'll topple it down. Mm, thank you. Please, let's give them a round of applause. And I'm sure many of you know um, our own Pastor Warnock from Ebenezer Baptist Church. He's going to close us out and give us some thoughts and share what uh, Ebenezer is doing regarding this um, situation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for this time. I, I want to thank Colby uh, Kelly of um, struggle is public square media thank you for this opportunity I'm I'm grateful to be here wasn't this a, a wonderful conversation a vital conversation uh, important <clears throat> doesn't leave you you know uh, feeling great when you leave here but it, it leaves you feeling like you've got work to do and so um, I'm thankful for this film uh, Rikers an American jail as it provides a lens into this American problem. Um, I, I have been very focused on this whole issue of mass incarceration. And as I said to a group the other day, perhaps, perhaps I need to find a more nuanced way of saying it, but I, I've been saying that this is the central moral issue of our times. Uh, in terms of domestic issues at least, I, I really uh, see it uh, as an extension of Dr. King's work. Um, I, I, I listed, listened with great interest um, uh, as the discussion moved forward with uh, Sister Askia, did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, talking about, you know, the pressure to take a plea. And um, the tragic side of that, of course, is that many of our young people who perhaps never serve a day in jail or just there waiting trial for a few days end up with what amounts to a life sentence because the tragic irony of the moment is that once you carry that mark of convicted um, many of the forms of discrimination that Dr. King and others fought to push back are legal, they're re-inscribed, right, in the criminal justice system, voting rights, voting discrimination, legal, housing discrimination, legal, job discrimination, legal. Uh, Michelle Alexander's right, she calls it the new Jim Crow. I call it the new and improved Jim Crow uh, because in, in many ways it's worse. Part of the perverse genius of this mass incarceration system is it uses stigma, the stigma of criminality 
uh, to inoculate itself against critique. And much of the American public is buying into this narrative. What I'm saying is that those of us who were born, I'm the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church without the King preach. I was born a year after Dr. King was assassinated. But those, who are, those of us who are a part of the post-civil rights generation, we don't have to ask the question any, anymore, what would we have done if we lived through those times? The question is, what are we doing? What are we doing? I'm, I'm convicted by that. And in some ways, and I say this carefully and respectfully, uh, you know, I, I, I pastor many of the folk who were engaged in that struggle. In some ways, I feel like our lift uh, if it's not heavier, it's every bit as heavy. And this is what I mean. It's, it's one thing to stand up in Montgomery for Rosa Parks, whom Dr. King called in his first book one of the most dignified and respected citizens of Montgomery. It's another thing to find the moral vocabulary with which to defend uh, young sisters and brothers poor in our inner cities, uh, where a third or as many as half of black, uh, uh, black men are caught up in the criminal justice system. It's another thing to defend those against whom many in the African American community are angry. Because part of what we carry as oppressed people is this idea that you, you need to be a credit. That's old school. Y'all know anything about that? You gotta be a credit to the race. I, I wonder if white people ever watch the news and see somebody do something stupid and say to themselves, I sure hope he ain't white. <laughs> See, the black people know what I'm talking about. I thought I'd let you in on that. See, because privilege blinds you to certain things. You, you carry a certain kind of burden. And giving in to this kind of politics of respectability is what has uh, robbed us of our, of our ability to speak with moral power to this issue that I see as the central moral issue of our time. So uh, I'm planning later this year, uh, along with my good friends at Public Square Media, we met recently and they said they're going to help. So I said that publicly, you're on the hook. <laughs> um, and. Um, Auburn Theological Seminary in New York. They're 200 years old this year. But Ebenezer, the spiritual home of Martin Luther King Jr., we decided that this year, we haven't set the date yet, but before the year's up, probably in the fall, we're going to convene faith leaders and others, activists from around the country, to explore, to explore. We haven't figured out how to do it. I, have, I do not know how to do this. But we're trying to figure out, Johnny, how, how to have an interfaith movement to abolish mass incarceration in this country. And, um, <clears throat> and so I'm grateful for this time because I, I want to ask for your help. And we're serious about this. We're committed. It is going to happen. Uh, we're going to have a national conference that is global or national in its perspective, but situated in Georgia. Where we, I think we have the longest, we keep people in, on probation in Georgia longer than anywhere else. So while the governor has been good in some ways on this criminal justice issue, you know, we disagree about 90% of the time. So when I can say good job, I try to do it. But he's been good on a lot of, in some ways, on this issue. Uh, but we keep people on probation a long time through these private probation systems. And they end up as part of this whole cycle. So we're going to have a conference to focus on this, but it's not a conference to talk. It's a conference to do what I think we must do, and that is we've got to somehow figure out how to, out how to have a movement. You all, I think we need a movement. We need a movement uh, around this issue, and I think Brother Perez is right. You know, if you kind of look at the whole elephant, you'll be overwhelmed. But you can find little ways of getting at this issue. So I'm, I'm done. It's a dangerous thing to ask a Baptist preach, preacher to stand at a mic on Sunday. See, I think this is my pulpit. I'm just kidding. I'm almost done. But um, last year, our church uh, hosted two expungement events. We used our moral authority uh, to partner with Fulton County and say to the county, 
you know, it takes 120 days for people with an arrest record. These are not convictions, arrest records, to get their record expunged. It takes 120 days, you usually got to knock on several doors. Most people, a lot of people don't even know it exists. They don't know how to navigate it. You pay a fee, and maybe you'll get your record expunged. We used the moral authority of the church. I hooked up with John Eves, who was chair of the commission at the time, and he and I agreed to have this expungement event at Ebenezer, America's Freedom Church. And uh, to make a long story short, the judges, the district attorney, and the public defenders, and the clerks were all in the same room, which is a miracle, because they're not used to cooperating. Right, Sister Askia, they're not used to cooperating. And the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, they were also there because they have the computer system. And I said, whoa, GBI, they know if you got an outstanding warrant. If I announce to people that they can come to church and get their records expunged, I can't have the church be a trap house. And they show up and get arrested, not at church. Not, that is not going to happen on, on our church campus. So they agreed not to even look at the page in the computer that would tell them whether or not this person who was hoping to get an expungement had an outstanding warrant. So to make a long story short, we set up this command center in our banquet hall, and so far we have expunged 1,000 criminal arrest records. So the other, day, the other day I was in the barbershop. True story, I was in the barbershop. I know you say, well, come on, I was in the barbershop, really, sitting there, and, uh, you know, they got to hook me up with, you know, whatever they can do. So, and this brother walked in, and he said, Rev, great event the other day, uh, the expungement a few months ago. I said, thank you. He said, and I was on the way trying to get out of the barber, barber's chair, trying to get to my appointment. He said, no, you don't understand. You expunged my record. And he looked real respectable like some of you. You know, he looked real, you know, he didn't look like a criminal. And he said, you expunged my record. 20 years ago, I had an issue with a bad check. 20 years ago. Now, again, these are criminal arrest records. He hadn't been convicted of anything. He said, for 20 years, I haven't been able to get a good job. I have a job, but I have a job, but nothing, nothing commensurate with my skill set. He said, but you expunged my record that day, and I want you to know that since then, I've gotten a much better job. I'm making a whole lot more money, he said and my family's better off, my whole quality of life has changed. He said, it's even better than that. There's a kid in my family, his young parents had them, but they weren't ready for a baby. And the kid was about to go into foster care. He said, you know, a year ago when I had a record, defects wouldn't have looked at me, but because I no longer have to check the box, I was able to adopt a kid in my own family. And so now two generations are better off because somebody expunged an arrest record. So just go home thinking about that. It was an arrest record. So I'm glad and I'm mad. I'm glad we were able to help him, but I'm mad when I think about it because they taught me in ninth grade civics that in America, you're innocent until proven guilty. And I've discovered that it's much more complicated than that. That because of poverty, through bail, this bail, cash bail system, arrest records, that employment uh, that employers can see, even though you weren't ever convicted of anything, many people in our country are living a reality right now in which they are guilty until proven innocent. And then even after proven innocent, he's walking around 20 years handcuffed. So we've got work to do, it's a civil rights issue, it's a human rights issue. I think I'm mad at the faith community, we've got to find a way to find our moral voice. If we are stuck and focused on little micro moralisms, we will not do what we need to do. None of us wants to be judged forever on the basis of our dumbest day, right? So I think the faith community has a particular role to play here because our job is to help people to think about morality and ethics. And I think we can do more than any other community to deal with this issue of stigma because it's tied up with religion and culture. Uh, so I hope you'll join us. When I say inner faith, I truly mean inner faith. How inner faith? I mean atheist too. 
Because if you say that, you know, I don't believe in God, if you're talking about the God who is racist and classist and more concerned about, you know, whether somebody had a cigarette and doesn't care what's happening to these brothers who are locked up in the hole, if that's the God you're talking about, then I'm an atheist too. I don't know that God. Uh, but the God I know is the one of love and justice. And um, uh, we've got work to do. Let's journey together. Thank you so much for this time. Let me sit down before I either have an altar call or raise the offer. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been